We'll just make sure that all of our technology is working. There we go. It looks like, all right, we're live streaming on YouTube. <laughs> okay. So it is at the top of the hour. Uh, welcome, everybody. I am Dr. Deirdre Pickerel. I'm the Dean of Student Success for York Hill University and Toronto Film School. And on behalf of the Student Success team, I am very pleased to welcome you to today's Ask an Expert session. If you're a regular watcher, our goal with these sessions is to provide all of our students across all programs, all brands, with information, tips, and resources to help them be successful throughout their programs and beyond. Our expert today will offer some brief thoughts on the topic of the day. Brief is tough because this topic is pretty uh, meaty. Um, and then we will take your questions. I have disabled the chat today, so please direct all your questions to the Q&A panel at the bottom of your screen. I'll let you know when we're ready for those. Today is a little bit bittersweet for us here at Ask an Expert because this is our last session for 2020. We launched last March. We have been going pretty much every Friday since then. Um, this was one of many initiatives to really engage and interact with students when COVID forced the closure of all of our campuses. Little did we know at that time that we would still be closed as of December and of course beyond. I don't think anybody really thought that this would, this pandemic would, would last for so long. Um, at this point, I would really like to extend my deepest, deepest thanks to those who have supported us um, over these many, many months. Uh, the tech team and marketing and Carly and, and all of the team there that has really helped us with the technology and made sure we can broadcast. Our experts, Fred, this is a, a Fred is a returning expert, so we deeply, deeply appreciate the experts who have been so incredibly generous with their time and their energy, and of course, to all of you, our viewers. Today's topic is busting anxiety tools to assist your effectiveness. It's very timely as we head into the holiday season and probably one of the strangest holidays that any of us may ever have. Um, as we, uh, on top of that, it's the end of the semester and we're going into a new year that, that still is uncertain. So I'm absolutely thrilled to welcome back Dr. Fred Dombrowski, one of our incredible MACP instructors. Uh, Dr. Fred, we're a little informal here, Fred, I hope that's okay, uh, has worked in the field of mental health since 1990 and has worked in higher education since 2010. He specializes in cognitive behavioral therapy and has worked in various treatment settings, including outpatient treatment, inpatient treatment, residential treatment, and at university counseling centers. And with that, it's enough for me. Fred, over to you. Well, thank you so much for the introduction. And I would like to thank everyone who's joining us today uh, for the people that are here and also the people that are live streaming. And yes, this is absolutely unprecedented times. And the although the times are extremely tough, it, it exacerbates test anxiety and all the other potential concerns that go with that. So I'm really happy to talk to you today about some ways that we can bust some test anxiety. And as we work on this, you could actually find you can apply these tools to varying aspects of your lives. So let me just share my screen here. Great, okay. So can everyone share the screen? Give me a thumbs up if you can see it. Great, thank you. Okay, so as we we're saying, um, talking about busting test anxiety, and usually particularly what happens, a lot of students have a lot of stuff that's invested when you attend a university. You're thinking about your goals of being a professional, you're trying to assist your family, you're working, and what kind of stinks is it feels sometimes that if you get a bad grade on a test or a paper, that everything else starts to fall apart. And while that definitely feels that way, that may not necessarily always be the case. So we have a few particular goals for our presentation today. Specifically, we want to identify changes that happen within you when you are experiencing anxiety. Sometimes when we are experiencing our anxiety, we're not paying attention to the triggers or the cues, but rather we get stuck in our heads. So we want to pull ourselves out of our heads and be able to settle ourselves down so then we could refocus on what we know. We also want to identify mindfulness techniques to interrupt overwhelming feelings of anxiety related to tests. Also, we're gonna engage in some uh, brief cognitive behavioral therapy to help us challenge our thoughts that are related to test anxiety. And as I was saying, you can apply some of this to other triggers that you may have in your life and also discuss the difficult time of that occurs right after you take a test than when you're waiting for the results of the test. That is absolutely torture. So while we are getting ready to get started, I would like to have us begin by engaging in a mindfulness technique. And 
I am sure that a lot of people who are attending today have a million different things that are happening. It's entirely okay and it's normal. Your brain is designed to try to make sense out of everything that just happened and also try to predict what's going to happen in a couple of minutes from now. It's very hard for our brains to be right here in the moment. Mindfulness means to be connected right here in the moment. So what I'm gonna ask us to do is we're gonna all engage in a quick mindfulness activity where I'm gonna ask you specifically to focus in on your senses. While we are doing this, it's going to be normal that you're gonna have a thought. But what I'm asking to do is when that thought comes in, just let recognize the thought is there, but then also let that thought go. So what I'm gonna ask everyone to do is if you can, Sit in a posture which is comfortable for you, preferably feet on the ground solidly, and then hands and palms on your knees. And we're going to start off with some breaths, and then we're going to do some meditation where we're going to be focusing in on just imagining that we have a ball of light on us, and we want to focus in on that. So I'm going to ask if we can all just close our eyes. I'm going to do a few deep breaths, and when we do the deep breaths, you inhale for six seconds, hold for two seconds, and then exhale for six seconds. So let's try this out. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Inhale. Hold. Exhale. Inhale, exhale, be focused on your breathing. Inhale, exhale, two more times. Inhale, exhale. Inhale, and exhale. So while you are here in this moment, I'm going to ask that if you can, imagine there is a ball of light that is touching the top of your head. The ball of light is warm, and I would like you to focus in on the potential feeling of the warmth of the ball of light at the top of your head. If you experience any other thoughts at this time, recognize that the thoughts are there and then let them go and then refocus in on that ball of light. I'm gonna ask that if you can, imagine the ball of light is moving down the right side of your head, going by your right temple, now moving by your right cheek, moving by the right side of your jaw to the part where your jaw connects to your neck the ball of light is now moving down your right shoulder. And now the ball of light is moving out on the outside of your right arm. You can now feel the ball of light at your elbow as it moves down to your right forearm. And we're also imagining that the ball of light is now at your right hand. The ball of light is now going back up on the inside of your arm and you can feel it on the forearm. Now at the elbow and coming up on the inside of your right arm, connecting to your torso. We're gonna imagine the ball of light is crossing your chest. You could feel the ball of light move over the right side of your chest, now to the center. You could feel the ball of light moving across your heart and now to the inside of your left arm. The ball of light is now moving down the inside of your left arm. You can feel it at your left elbow. The ball of light is now moving down to your left forearm. The ball of light is now on your left palm. The ball of light is now moving back up the outside of your left arm, your left forearm, now your left elbow, moving up in the upper arm on the outside of the left arm, going up to the upper part of the left shoulder, outside to where the shoulder meets the neck, 
Now moving up to your left cheek, moving up to your left temple. And now the ball of light is now sitting back where it started at the top of your head. Okay, and if you can, open up your eyes. So this is a very brief mindfulness technique. If you want to take this fuller, you could actually have the ball of light go all across your body, including both legs, um, also your stomach as well. But the idea is to help you become focused. Now, I hope that for everyone who has engaged with this, you are actually just feeling better in the moment. Unfortunately, what happens is during the, uh, when we experienced test anxiety, our thoughts and our feelings of anxiousness take us outside of what we are experiencing. So this right here is the information about the mindfulness exercise that we just basically did. But when we are experiencing anxiety, anxiety is normal and it's a feeling of nervousness or caution. Anxiety is letting you know that there is a problem and that you have to take care of it. It also helps us to become more aware of our surroundings and it helps us to protect ourselves. It does increase our senses and it can give us additional energy to manage a situation. With that said though, there are some drawbacks to anxiety, specifically the feeling of being overwhelmed and ongoing anxiety impacts your focus. And when we talk about the fight, flight or freeze, as people are stuck in that situation for a while, they'll then collapse. Seemingly easy things are difficult to complete when you're experiencing anxiety. So for people who are experiencing test anxiety, what happens is you'll ha experience people who are thinking so much about a question. So let's say, for example, the question is two plus two. Seems like a very easy question to answer. When I was in grad school, I found that I never liked taking group tests, tests with other people in the group, because I was always very straightforward with my answers. And there was always that one person who had test anxiety in the group. And they would say, well, two plus two, that equals four. But what if it's a trick question? What if one of the twos is a negative two, but they just didn't say it. So therefore, the answer is really zero. And I'm like, oh, gosh, you're right. So if I put the answer is four, I'm going to get the answer wrong. And if the answer is really zero, oh, man, I'm going to mess up everything. We're looking too deeply into it. So sometimes the anxiety will help us read too much into a question and have far too many concerns. Sometimes we're not paying attention to the anxiety. We're only paying attention to our thoughts. So when we have the test anxiety, we're really worried about failing the test. We're really worried about how life is going to be impacted, but we're not paying attention to the tightness that we're experiencing in our chest. Um, for me, I definitely experience anxiety in my chest. I, I know some people experience it in their stomach. We often experience the shallow breaths, and that's one of the benefits of doing the deep breathing. It helps reset ourselves. But also we have increased sweat, headache, muscle aches and fatigue, lightheadedness and nausea. Very normal to experience in the body, but sometimes we're just not paying attention to it because we're so focused in on the, the test. Sometimes you have people who are so focused in on the test that unfortunately the nausea and the headache come during the test. And that will then exacerbate and how can anyone do well on a test when you're experiencing nausea and anxiety. So we're going to kind of skip through this. Uh, these are just information about generalized anxiety. Basically, it's talking about experiencing anxiety for um, uh, more often than not for at least six months. And I just wanted to put this in there. So if your anxiety is so uh, prolonged that it's been occurring for over six months and it occurs even if you do not have a test, please feel free to uh, reach out to um, a health professional who can then talk to you about this. There is a difference between, you know, generalized anxiety and then test anxiety. Test anxiety is very situational, situational. And if you are experiencing ongoing anxiety for such a long time and it's impacting your daily functioning, please reach out for help. And if, uh, if you have any questions, feel free to send us some questions later on afterwards and we can give you some information about what the university has. So, we want to learn to interrupt anxiety with mindfulness. Now, the what we did earlier today, like when we first started, was a really fun basic mindfulness activity. But sometimes when we try to do those mindfulness activities where we're focused in on the ball, we have to pay attention to the ball. And therefore, it's kind of hard because those thoughts come in and out. The good news is there are varying types of mindfulness activities. 
when we do mindfulness act activities, it does help the brain refocus. It decreases the physical response. So it decreases the sweating, it decreases the heart rate, and it can be relatively quick and uh, gives us a connection to our senses and resets our cognitive process. So when we are mindful, it means that we are being in the moment. We are paying attention to our senses. Uh, it's very normal as humans for us to be trapped in our heads. And when we are trapped in our heads, sometimes it's not helpful for us. Being focused in at one specific sense at a time will help us become more focused. So we talked about some guided activities. And uh, as I was talking about the ball, that is a guided activity. But sometimes... Some people benefit from more active mindfulness activities. So I know this sounds ridiculous. If you are experiencing some test anxiety, what I'm asking you to do is if you have a stick of deodorant, I know this sounds crazy, but open up the stick of deodorant, smell it, and then try to describe what it smells like. We all use deodorant. We use it every day. We don't pay any attention to it. Try to describe how the deodorant actually feels. Uh, what's the top of it feel like, but actually be focused in on the deodorant. Now, as ridiculous as this is, I've worked with people who experience panic, panic attacks. And when we have them refocus in on deodorant or even Skittles, something you can focus in with your tongue, the sense of taste, um, or something tactily like sandpaper, that will help the individual refocus and it will interrupt their anxiety. As ridiculous as it is, one of my favorite ways to bust anxiety is by playing Jenga. And so if you're thinking about a test, there's only so much thinking about a test that you can do. After that, you're making things much more worse. Giving yourself to refocus in on something can help. So test anxiety is very normal for students, but it spreads like wildfire. So if you have that one student in the class who's living with test anxiety, unfortunately that will then catch on to the other students around. Anxiety does make us second guess ourselves, and it decreases group effectiveness and it clogs the thought process and it can be overall, to the, overall detrimental to the grade. So these are some regular thoughts we see with test anxiety. I won't get an A, I'll have to retake the class. This is unfair. I won't get a job. I'm stupid. I can't take exams. This isn't for me. My life is ruined and everything sucks. So these are very normal thoughts. And while the thoughts make sense, the thoughts are not entirely accurate. When we have the thought, the thought then gives us a feeling of anxiety and panic. And that panic impacts our feelings and then prevents us from being able to perform. So the trigger is... We have to take a test. Our automatic thoughts are, I can't do this. I'm going to fail. Life is going to suck. We feel anxious, overwhelmed, and then we actually do worse on the test than we would have. So these are a list of cognitive distortions. I will um, make sure that I can get this information out to you if anyone's interested, specifically about a list of cognitive distortions. But what we see for people who experience test anxiety is that they're experiencing catastrophizing, making things out to be worse than they are. You can fail a test and eventually still pass. You can reach out to the teacher for help. Also, um, holding yourself uh, to double standard, being much more cruel to yourself than you would be to another person. If you saw another student who was struggling, you might be very supportive of them. So when you are experiencing those thoughts, we want to encourage you to do some mindfulness techniques to interrupt that. And then from there, challenge the thoughts such as, what is the evidence that I can do this? And there's some really good evidence to show that everyone can be successful. You've all gotten to this point. You all have had experience in the past where you have done well. Maybe you also have some experience where you haven't done well, and you have some skills that can help you. The good news is that you can ask for help, and you are not alone. There are some wonderful services here at the university that we're able to help you with. Also, sometimes you really do know the information, even though you don't feel like you know. Also in the past, you must have passed enough exams in order to make it this far. So as you challenge your thoughts, you will feel better, and that will then help you make some improvements in regards to how you then take the exam. When, all right, so just quick studying tips. When you are studying, make sure you space studying out. If you put all the studying too close together, it's going to increase your anxiety. Actually, also physically write down the information. Not typing, when you write it down, it helps your brain repeat it. 
practice tests and exams are helpful and also read out loud when you're reading. That actually helps your brain read it twice. Take a break when you're overwhelmed, exercise, get appropriate rest. I know that word sleep is like a, it's like a funny word that people don't get enough of and you have to make time for it. Definitely limit social media. You can go down the rabbit hole with that and do what works for you and adopt a growth mindset. The growth mindset means as you are a student, you're not expected to be perfect. You're only expected to grow. So going forward, as you have that post-test anxiety, you're going to be thinking about all the, all the questions. Maybe I should have done this. Maybe I should have done that. I know I messed up. Unfortunately, those thoughts don't help. So to interrupt those thoughts, we ask that you engage in some kind of physical activity, whether it be running, jogging. Like for me, I love running. Uh, that's my thing. But also even cooking, something that can get the other senses involved. That's when you connect with your supports, connect with your friends, connect with people who are not related to school, just so you can get your mind off of it. Transition to a different event and interrupt rumination with additional mindfulness. Like you can always go back to a mindfulness activity. As ridiculous as it is, playing video games can be mindful because you're paying attention to that video game and everything else turns off. So when we conceptualize test anxiety, think about it as a trigger, thought, feeling, and action. Your trigger is you're having a test. Your thought is you're feeling, you're thinking that you can't do this. You're feeling overwhelmed and it then impacts your ac action. Our thoughts are not always accurate though. Our inaccurate thoughts exacerbate anxiety. We can use mindfulness to decrease our anxiety to find different ways that we could think about the test. And therefore we engage in different activities. After the test, Make sure that you're engaging in activities that are not related to school, but also physical activities to help you then manage that anxiety while you're waiting. Test anxiety is normal. During anxiety, we avoid looking at the entire problem. We only look at one problem, one specific aspect of it. Use mindfulness to enter it up. Engage in healthy study habits prior to the test. Ask for help from the professor in school and for related services. And you have made it this far providing evidence that you can do it. You can do it. You have made it this far. So we have about eight minutes left over for questions. So I would like to uh, turn it over to everyone. I'm going to stop my slide share right now. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to ask them. Yeah, just use that, that uh, Q&A panel. I, Fred, I really loved how you talked about um, writing it down because I'm a, I'm a techie at heart. I love gadgets and all that sort of stuff, but I have, a, like, I write everything down. Like, I learned that a long time ago, and I think we get so reliant on technology that we actually forget that really one of the best ways to, even though we have to submit anything by paper, we, you know, everything by email and all this sort of stuff is, is really encouraging students to um, to have that tactile notion of, of a pen and a piece of paper or a pencil or a favorite pad or you know any of those sorts of things that are just so important and I think we forget in our technology laden world. Absolutely and it's funny because I think a lot of us are so used to typing that when we actually do write it down it feels weird to actually write. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I, I, I actually feel bad for youth today because it's like Everything is so technology that I sometimes wonder, do they know how to write? Like, <laughs> you know, you see the jokes with writing cursive and, and kids won't be able to read it because, you know, I don't know that we focus that as much on actually equipping people to write with like our kids to write with a, a pen and a piece of paper, right? Because like, everything is so technology focused. Everybody's on tablets and all that sort of stuff. But it really is an important skill, um, mm -hmm. you know, for us in a lot of different ways, it seems. Yes, absolutely. And I appreciate when you talked about how we are so connected with technology. Unfortunately, uh, if we go down the rabbit hole of social media while we are experiencing test anxiety, yeah. we could all hear horror stories about instances where people have had bad tests or times they didn't get along with their teachers. Those experiences are not going to help you with your test anxiety. Um, sometimes even just focusing on pictures of cats or just anything that just gets your mind off of it can be helpful. But if we focus right. too much on the rabbit hole, it's not going to work. Um, right. So does anyone have any questions at all? I, I'm looking at the Q&A. looks like no, no questions are posted. It looks like you're, you're getting off easy. <laughs> oh, I, I absolutely don't mind. I mean, I could, I can talk about this stuff forever as I absolutely enjoy yeah. this. Um, yeah. What I will say yeah. is 
as there are no questions, I, I do want to go back just a little bit to how we can interrupt our thoughts. So I'm going to reshare and I'm going to reshare a slide, but also feel free to, um, if someone does come up with a question, feel free to interrupt me. So let me just share my screen again, go back to the cute puppy. All right. As um, some people may have heard my puppy barking in the background, this is not him. Um, my, my dog is a little more of a brat, but that's okay. So um, moving back. Okay, so these are some questions that we can ask ourselves when we are having those negative thoughts. And we could ask ourselves, what's the evidence for against this thought? So I'm going to fail. What's the evidence for this thought? Well, if you get a bad grade, you could fail. What's the evidence against this? Well, you've gotten bad grades in the past and you've also succeeded. What would I tell a friend in the same situation rather than what I tell myself? You most likely would probably tell someone, it's okay, you're going to be fine. We have to learn to tell ourselves that. What's the worst that could realistically happen and how bad that would be? The worst that could realistically happen is you fail a test. You fail a test. You may have to connect with your teacher. You may have to do a little more work. It may be unpleasant and it doesn't necessarily mean that you're not going to be able to obtain your goals. Is it really true that you must, should, or have to? Do you have to get the test perfectly in order to pass? Am I overgeneralizing from past occurrences? Sometimes people will assume that they, as they had some tough teachers in the past, that their current professors are now going to be difficult and the tests are now going to be difficult. Are there any other explanations besides blaming myself? Yeah. I mean, is there a possibility that there's a lot of information and it can be tough? Absolutely. Is the situation under your control? It is. You do have some power to be able to prepare for the test. When you focus in on that anxiety, though, you feel as if you are powerless. So what difference will this make next month, week, or year? So as I have to give everyone props here and you're in uh, college. And so I, if we think back to a, a test that you failed when you were in fifth grade, that test doesn't mean too much to you right now. Another really important question to ask yourself, though, is thinking this way, helping the situation, or making it worse? Sometimes our thoughts do just make it worse. And uh, if we think about everything that's currently happening right now with, uh, with COVID, if we focus in on all the bad stuff, and yes, there is a lot of bad stuff. Unfortunately, we do only make our lives worse. If we focus in on other things that we can control, such as you know wearing our masks, washing our hands, and still having connections with people that we love, either via the phone or via Zoom, we can focus on the things that we can control. How can my religious or uh, spiritual beliefs help me with this? And what advice would a therapist or mentor give me? And what can I accept about the situation? So these are some really helpful questions to be able to ask yourself when you are struggling with some of those thoughts. If you are feeling overwhelmed with the, with the feelings, though, if you are unable to ask yourself these thoughts, try to go back with some mindfulness techniques. If you go on YouTube, there's like dozens of mindfulness videos. Uh, but for me, I'm more of a proactive mindfulness guy. I need something to taste. I need something to smell. I need something to touch. And if someone tells me to focus in on my hands or focus in on like the feeling, I'm just not that guy. Right. It's uh, and Speaking of mindfulness, for... Um, I think we had about 14 or 15 episodes, but we were very thrilled within the mental health and wellness department to have an MACP practicum student. And we did mindfulness Mondays for quite a while. So, um, and that's available on a podcast. So we have, we've, we've, we've really tried to encourage students to, to practice mindfulness. Although I have to admit, this is the first time I've heard about the deodorant trick. Like that was interesting. <laughs> yes. I find that the more obnoxious, the mindfulness activity, the better it is. So when I was, uh, I was a director at a, a hospital, we had five inpatient units, two inpatient units for, for kids. And uh, so kids, obviously, they struggle to focus, totally normal. But we had them go in an empty room and walk around the empty room for a half hour to identify things they've never seen in the empty room. And they did wow. such a wonderful job. At, right, the end of, right. at the end of the half hour, they're like, I never noticed this on the floor. I never noticed this on the ceiling. But as ridiculous as it is, it's actually fun. Yeah, it's it what it really speaks to, I think, Fred, is is how powerful our minds are and how they can take us down a path that's very negative, but with a little bit of intervention like smelling or touching deodorant or rubbing sandpaper or walking around our room, we really do have the power to actually take back and 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 shift that focus into something else. So the you know, our, our brains can be our best friends and our worst enemies, right? Yes, of course. Perfectly stated. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, with that, we're we're at the end of our 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 half hour and and the end of our Ask an Expert for 2020. Dr. Fred, thank you so much for being here and sharing with us. It is definitely coming to be. I think it's like week ten in the in the undergraduate and the diploma program term or something. So ex exams are you know on the horizon, and uh, so this is absolutely very timely. Um, once again, I would like to thank all of our viewers and our support team and the Student Success Unit for making Ask an Expert a really big success this year. We are done for 2020. We will be back January the 8th. We'll have a slightly different approach um, for Ask an Expert in 2020, but we will be back and we really look forward to seeing all of you then. In the meantime, be well, be safe, and please take care of yourselves. All the best. Thanks, Fred. Have a good one. Bye-bye.